Hey everyone, so uh, this is a little bit of an experiment that uh, that I'm going to try to do. Uh, so as many of you know, I write a blog. It's sort of a math and spirituality blog. It's uh, called Numbers and Angels. Uh, you can find the link in the comments section, if this actually has a comment section. I don't know if it will or not, but we'll see. Um, and it's sort of a series of reflections that I write on, you know, how I view the intersection of uh, mathematics, which I'm in my PhD program for, uh, and spirituality, and how those and how those two ideas sort of uh, inform each other. And it's a bit philosophical and a few other things, and uh, it's a lot of fun, and I've really enjoyed writing it. I took a long, long break from it uh, this past year uh, for PhD reasons, because grad school is freaking hard. Um, but I began running into this issue, and the issue that I began running into is I don't really have a good way of describing or, or of answering the question, uh, so Dom, what exactly do you do? Uh, what is math? What does it look like? And that's a hard question to answer because it requires a lot of, uh, you know, different background material to understand what I'm working on, for one thing, uh, but also just the general motivations behind what exactly it is that we do. Uh, so I wanted to try, you know, this is a very difficult uh, sort of issue to address in a written blog, uh, especially a written blog on Wix, because Wix is a, it has a lot of serious limitations when it comes to uh, multimedia presentations. So I decided that, you know, well, if I can't write and neatly type out in, in, in a nice, clean way uh, what my different, you know, projects are, what if I tried making videos about it? So this is a little bit of an experiment into uh, what exactly video blogging looks like. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to continue doing this, but I just thought that I would, um, I thought that I would give it a shot. So, uh, so today I wanted to address this first question, which is, well, what generally does mathematics study? Fundamentally, I think that mathematics can be thought of as, um, you know, the science of abstraction, of logical abstraction. You take an idea that, for example, you figure you know, you know, you've got a pretty good idea, for example, about how you add numbers together or something, you know, really silly like that, uh, but you want to find a way of, you know, really generally understanding it. So that's, for example, what high school algebra is. High school algebra and high school geometry is taking ideas of shapes and numbers and uh, things that we generally have a pretty good idea about and then saying, okay, well, what if we looked at numbers you know, a little more generally than just 1 and 2 and 5 and negative 3 and adding these things together, multiplying them and things like that. Well, what if, for example, we want to talk about properties of any numbers? You know, for example, that, uh, that 3 plus 5 is 8, and also 5 plus 3 is 8, additive commutativity. It's generally true that x plus y and y plus x are the same thing, additive commutativity. It's the idea of generalization. And that's fundamentally what mathematics is all about. It's all about finding patterns that you know are generally true and you want to make them a little more abstract. Now, numbers are the easy part. Numbers are the easy thing that we can all, okay, not easy per se, but we know that, you know, we know how they work. And, you know, that, that sort of gets uh, a little, um, that gets old after a while. Uh, I apologize to all the number theorists. I may have just defended with that. Numbers are interesting, but it's not really what I want to talk about right now. What I do want to talk about is a slightly different idea of generalization, and it's a generalization of distance. What exactly do we mean by distance? Well, okay, we, we mean how far apart are two things. Okay, fine. But what does that mean? Like, what does it really mean to say that two things are such and such distance apart from each other. Now we have a very good and very nice way of understanding what distance means in a plane, in a flat, perfectly natural, you know, uh, Cartesian, uh, Euclidean uh, plane. We know what that looks like. And we, we certainly we have a very good visual idea about what these things look like. Here's one point, here's another point, and it's the distance between them. We can compute that, and we understand what that thing is. Uh, but that's not the only way of defining distance. What do you mean it's not the only way of defining distance? That's the only way that makes sense. That's exactly what the this distance is. It's the distance between these two points. You have never lived in New York City, have you? So the problem is that you, uh, you when you're living in somewhere that's not, you know, just this open, flat plane, if you're trying to get, get from the Lower East Side of New York to Times Square, well, that's not very far apart. It's only a couple. It's only a couple miles, but it feels a lot longer, doesn't it? Because it is a lot longer 
in the city block metric. That's not the same thing as the metric between two points. You can't just go straight there. You have to go this way and then this way and then up a certain number of blocks. It's the city block metric. It's a different way of defining distance. Equally valid, certainly very useful, and always used as a way of defining distance. But it's a different way of doing it. And that's the key point. It's a different way of defining distance. For that matter, when you're, whenever you're on a plane, planes also define distance in a different way. They can't define distance on a flat surface because the Earth isn't flat. So they need a different way of defining it that way. And they use geodesics and they have to define, well, what's the quickest way to get from one point on the globe to the other point? And, um, and to do that, you, you know, you can't treat distance as if your world is flat because that, because the world isn't flat and that causes problems. So there are all these different ways of defining distance. And the mathematician asks, well, we can't use the same formula for every single kind of scenario. The same formula isn't going to work in every single circumstance for defining distances. So we have to have a different way of doing it. What is distance? How do you define distance? distance. And the way we do that is we say, okay, well, these are the properties that a distance should have. So to start off, suppose we've got some space x. x is going to be uh, the space of points that we're interested in. And suppose we've got two points, we're going to call them p and q, and p and q are two points in x. And, you know, x can be anything, but I'm going to draw it as if it's the plane. x is just a plane of points, and you've got some distance between them from p to q. And we write that as d of p and q. d, p, q is a distance function if the following hold. So again, our objective is to generalize what a distance is. So what are the properties that it should have? Well, the first property that this distance function should have is that d of p and q uh, should be greater than or equal to 0. And that should be clear enough because if you've got that the distance is negative, well, if the distance is negative, then I don't know what kind of universe that is. I mean, that's some weird Twilight Zone issue at that point if you've got, you know, the universe is, um, has negative distances, so we don't allow that. The second property that we have to have is that dpq uh, ha can only be zero in one very specific circumstance, and that one very specific circumstance is if p and q are actually equal to each other. So two things can happen. Either you've got p and q are different points in which your distance is positive, or they're the exact same point in which the distance is zero. And those mean the exact same thing. And that's natural enough. The third property that we require is also very geometric and very nice, uh, which is that the distance from P to Q has to be the same thing as the distance from Q to P. That if you take the distance between these two points, then, well, you can go in one direction or you can go in the other direction, and they're the exact same. The distance is, is completely independent of which point you take first. It's the same. The fourth property, and in some ways the most subtle and nuanced one in uh, mathematics, is suppose we've got a third point. We've got the third point, which we're going to call r. And the distance from p to r is less than or equal to the distance from p to q plus the distance from q to r. And that looks very scary and stuff, but actually this makes a lot of sense. And here's why. Suppose you've got your point p and you've got your point q. Uh, and you're going to stick in your third point, R, and you can get to R one of two different ways. Either you go to Q first, and then you go to R, or you can go straight from P to R. And certainly in this picture, it's very clear that the distance from P to R is less than the distance from P to Q and then Q to R, and that's exactly what this inequality says. It says that you can go to a point in two different ways, but if you go through another point, then that's a longer distance. So if you have some space, some universe x, and x has this metric structure on it, this, uh, this function d that satisfies these four properties, well in mathematics we call the pair of objects, x and d, a metric space. And metric spaces are beautiful and excellent and they have you know, a lot of really great properties. They really encompass a lot of mathematics and a lot of what uh, what my work is and what my colleagues' work is really revolves around metric spaces. So this is a small example, and in, in some ways a, r a relatively simple example, of the ways in which mathematics takes certain familiar ideas and, uh, and abstractifies them a little bit. I don't know if that's a word or not, but I want it to be, and I'm going to pretend that it is for now. Now, there are two things we're trying to do here. On the one hand, we're trying to make things a little more general, a little more abstract, and if you can do that, then you can say, you know, well, if you know that one property is true in a general metric space, 
then it will be true both if you're living in a plane, in a flat, totally, uh, totally fine plane, uh, or it will also work if you're in Manhattan, and it will also work if you're plotting an air flight uh, course, for example. It'll work in all these different contexts if you can prove it in the most general setting possible, which is a general metric space. And that's why we're doing this. Uh, well, it's one of the reasons we're doing this. Um, one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to make it as general as possible. So this is an example of the kind of uh, abstraction that mathematics really uh, purports and endeavors to do. Here in this case, in metric spaces, we're taking an, uh, an idea of distance, something that you know makes a lot of geometric sense to us, and making it a little bit more abstract. Now there are lots of other things you can make abstract. For example, you want to talk about uh, algebraic properties, you can talk about uh, multiplication and addition and uh, algebraic operations and this is the study of things like group theory and ring theory and things like that where you take ideas of numbers which you know how to add and multiply and you make it a little more general. Are there other things that we can multiply and add besides numbers? Yes there are and they're weird. Uh, one of the other things that you can do is you can do the same thing with volumes. We've talked about distances but there are also things that you can do involving volumes in which case you get things like measure spaces. They're really weird. Note to self, talk about measure spaces at some point. So this is the sense in which mathematics is really the science of abstraction. Uh, this is also in some ways of what makes mathematics the most philosophical of the sciences. Fortunately, it's also what makes it the most, uh, well, some people are going to hate me for saying this, but I think it is in some ways what makes mathematics the most objective of the sciences. In Just in, in terms of um, it's very strongly grounded, at least in principle, it's very strongly grounded in uh, really rigorously proving why things are true. And you can do it by writing down axioms and saying, here's what we know about distances, and here's why we know it. And to me, that's just one of the most exhilarating and incredible uh, aspects of our work, is that we're able to do these, um, we're able to answer these very general problems that seem to make a lot of sense in terms of the question, but answer them in, a, in an ironclad and irrefutable logical way. The interesting thing is, is that irrefutable logic also leads to some really weird stuff. There are some very strange results that come from mathematics as well. Uh, I probably have lost your attention by now at this point, so I'm not going to uh, get into that too much, but I will get into it in a later video. Um, I can't wait to do this again. This has been a lot of fun, and I'll probably make more of these videos uh, as, as time goes on. I've got, got a little more free time over the summer, so I'll do some of that right uh, this you know, this summer, hopefully I'll be able to shed some light into, uh, you know, what mathematicians do, you know, the kinds of questions we ask, what, you know, the way in which we think, which is really not that special, if, uh, if anything else. It's really just us, you know, asking the question, what if, all the time. Um, but it's so much fun, and I'm really excited about it, and, uh, you know, and I hope to, you know, show you a little bit more about, you know, the kinds of, uh, you know, the kinds of uh, questions that keep me up at night literally and figuratively. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. I'll see you next time.